much for being here. Um, thank you especially to the World Press Photo uh, and everyone who's organized this really excellent festival. It's a, an honor and a privilege. Um, so my name is Josh Begley. Uh, I am an artist and I primarily work with data. Uh, I make apps, websites, photographic projects, maps, visualizations, installations, uh, and increasingly short films. I'm interested in looking at the United States as a historical phenomenon, as a landscape. Uh, I make work in order to better see that landscape uh, and to attempt to understand how it has been constructed over time. My mode is observational. I work in a newsroom, but I'm not particularly concerned with breaking news. Uh, I'm interested in doing something similar to what Trevor Paglin has described as the purpose of his practice, to find better ways of seeing literally seeing the historical moment in which we live. Uh, to give you a sense of what I mean, I want to start with a brief video that you may have seen out in the front. Uh, it is made from every New York Times front page since 1852. of the image, right? Um, as you may have noticed from that video, the way we interpret and represent information has shifted quite a bit over the last 150 years. Uh, the shift from black and white to color, the move from text to image, uh, the squeezing out of written narrative from being at the center of our storytelling. I'm a person who spends a lot of time on my phone. Um, whether I'm on Instagram or Snapchat or looking at memes on Twitter or Facebook, much of the way I interpret the world is image-driven, um, and it's delivered to me, perhaps through a push notification on my phone. Increasingly, it's images, it's video. Um, I feel like my relationship to information has changed pretty drastically even over the last 10 years. So in wanting to make work that looks at the American landscape, I often gravitate toward mediums that can meet people where they are, uh, which in a large part for me and for my friends is on our phones. But let me back up and start at the beginning. Everything for me that is related to narrative, particularly in an American context, begins with Toni Morrison. I find this for a lot of reasons, um, but I'm interested in tracing the shape of the American landscape. So what is the shape of the American landscape? How might mining the break of the last few hundred years put into focus things just below the surface, things slightly hidden from view? I had the good fortune of seeing her speak uh, do, deliver a series of lectures last year. And after one of them in the Q&A, someone asked her a really simple question. They said, Toni Morrison, why literature? She said, I know the answer. You know the formula, she said. There's data, which becomes information, which becomes knowledge. But the step after that is wisdom. And neither one of those first three is sufficient. Literature, she continued, has always been the place to go for me because it's indeterminate, and it's provocative, and it can be beautiful. For the next little while, I want to take you through a few of the ways I've been thinking about visualizing data, turning numbers into narrative in the spirit of Toni Morrison, and consider a series of data-soaked geographies to make visual some of the violence behind the way we live. So let's go back a few years, before the New York Times was a newspaper, to some of the earliest attempts to chart the American landscape with numbers. The year is 1790. In 1790, the United States passed something called the Naturalization Act. It specified free white persons as being eligible for citizenship. 1790 was also the year of the first census, a census which produced some of the first American data. Um, and if you look closely at the categories, you'll see it was concerned with one thing, counting everyone in the country according to race, class, and gender. 
1850, the census added a slave schedule and the category mulatto. The names and life worlds of human beings were put into a ledger and reduced to numerical values. Over the years, other categories appear and disappear. Quadroon, octoroon, Hindu. The first digital project I ever made simply looked at the race question on every US census. I literally just took screenshots of old forms. How had racial categories changed over time? If the subject of the dream is the dreamer, what does the question say about the asker? This project is at racebox.org. In thinking about the landscape of the United States and the ways in which it has radically transformed since the first ships started arriving on its shores, I can't begin the narrative anywhere other than the transatlantic slave trade. It is what built the economy and what made possible a certain kind of modernity that the theorist Fred Moten understands through the lens of ecological disaster. But how might we think through its afterlife, right? The afterlife of slavery in a way that takes seriously its spatial dimension. What is a contemporary manifestation of slavery's historical residues? Something that might give us a window into what the history of the United States has to say about its present. I am increasingly convinced that there is no talking about the afterlife of slavery in the United States without also talking about its contemporary cousin, incarceration. To borrow a line from Claudia Rankine, there is no past to our past. For me, the first prison I ever saw with my own eyes was San Quentin. It was about 20 minutes from my parents' house growing up. It's stunning panoramic views, along with some of the folks I met inside, got me thinking about geography and landscape and what it would mean to visualize all these spaces of exception at once. How do you see something as sprawling as the prison industrial complex? Right? What does mass incarceration mean visually? If you were to zoom all the way out and focus only on these spaces of exception, what would that landscape look like? Around the time these questions became salient for me, I was lucky enough to be in a course about data representation at NYU. It was the first time I was introduced to the world of scripts and APIs or application programming interfaces, um, where you can literally just write a few lines of code and access data sets and make apps and, and websites. Um, there's an organization called the Prison Policy Initiative that keeps meticulous records on where incarcerated people are counted in the census. Uh, they do this to understand and to hopefully end prison-based gerrymandering where tax dollars flow to the places prisons are located rather than the towns prisoners come from. As a result, they have precise location data for every prison, jail, or detention center in the United States. Um, so as with most projects, the first thing I did was dig into their data and make this map. This is every carceral facility in the U.S., so 5,393 prisons. Um, but a map like this doesn't really tell you that much, right? There's just a lot of dots. Um, it turns out if you look at the data closely, you can pull out things like population, type of prison, latitude and longitude. Uh, so what I did for this next project, um, well, also the way an API works, is at least one like Google Maps, is you can give it this URL at the bottom, and it'll give you back this image. Um, it is as simple as swapping in a new latitude and longitude coordinate, it'll give you back a different image. So I wrote a script that would essentially do this process, which I'm doing manually. Um, You'll see I'm just copying and pasting latitude and longitudes into the browser. It gives me back a new image. Like that. Um, writing a script that would do that over and over again and go through the entire list of locations and pull an image for each one of those locations. Before long, I had this folder full of photographs, right? 5,393 of them. So what does the geography of incarceration in the United States look like? Here's one way to answer that question. We can go pretty quickly through these, I think.
In a recent series of essays, Trevor Paglin, the artist and geographer, lays out what he thinks photography has become in the age of seeing machines. Beginning from the premise that despite Instagram, despite Facebook, despite the flood of real-time photos uploaded to Facebook or Snapchat or iCloud, the majority of photographs being taken today are images made by machines for other machines to see. Right? That is a crazy idea for me to wrap my head around. The idea that most images being taken today will never be seen by a human eye. Um, to do this, he uses the example of automated license plate readers, persistent drone cameras, uh, clandestine fees from, from spy satellites. I think about a script, Paglin says, as the basic function of an imaging system, its style of seeing, and the relationship between seer and seeing it produces, the obvious ways in which a seeing machine sculpts the world. As someone who writes scripts, specifically computer scripts designed to capture digital images, I find this way of thinking about seeing quite useful. What does it mean for a machine to want to see something? Who writes the code for that machine? What purpose does it serve? For me, what does it mean to represent carceral space, right? These spaces designed to cage human beings, spaces that disproportionately cage human beings who are racialized as black. What does it mean to represent that as a landscape free of human form? Um, I would offer that some of these landscapes are in fact not free of human form. While you can, a lot of my work is concerned with zooming all the way out, you can certainly see something if you zoom all the way in. Um, in this case, the silhouettes of the people being warehoused. This is ADX Florence in Colorado. Um, I want to linger here for a moment on this notion of silhouettes. What can be seen in a shadow? What can be gleaned from negative space? If all one has is the outlines of a thing unsaid, does that constitute data worth visualizing? In her seminal essay, Unspeakable Things Unspoken, Toni Morrison says it plain. We can agree, I think, that invisible things are not necessarily not there. That a void may be empty, but not be a vacuum. In addition, certain absences are so stressed, so ornate, so planned, they call attention to themselves, arrest us with intentionality and boredom, like neighborhoods that are defined by the population held away from them. Morrison describes her endeavor in unspeakable things as a search, in other words, for the ghost in the machine. I wonder if a focus on the apparatus of something like incarceration might begin to people the violence in a way that frames the still unfolding ecological disaster of slavery and settler colonialism, the photographic after image of their wake as being in fact what Moton calls a disaster that falls upon the earth. A ghost in the machine is also a way some people think about drones. The United States, of course, the first nation to kill someone with a ghost in the machine, um, has operated drones in the skies of Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, over Niger and West Africa, uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border, and elsewhere. Drones have become a second cousin to the satellite, providing a similar kind of imagery, a lidless eye, that can give persistent 24-hour surveillance, essentially a God's eye view of the ground. Some of them carry missiles. That said, most of the time, this is me. Right? Walking down the street on my phone, sending somebody a snap, scrolling through Instagram. I could not be further from the wars being carried out in my name. Around the time I was thinking about the geography of incarceration, I started thinking about the drone wars and how I could not see, like literally could not imagine what was on the other side of my country's missiles. Despite the fact that I came of age in the post 9-11 era, I couldn't tell you how many countries we were at war with, uh, let alone place those countries on a map. So I had an idea, and it was a really, really simple idea. I said, what if I made an app? What if every time a US drone strike was reported in the news, I got a little notification? Um, would that change my relationship at all to these wars? Would it make me second guess a push notification that feels like it's coming from my friend, but instead it's this unsettling news? Would it change my relationship to war? I choose to get notified about all sorts of things on my phone, whenever someone mentions me on Twitter, when someone tags me on Instagram, when certain people send me an email or a text. Would learning about every drone strike in real time change my relationship at all to this form of violence? The central question of the app was this, do we want to be as connected to our foreign policies as we are to our smartphones? And the hypothesis, of course, was no, right? Why would anyone want to receive these alerts? Um, say I'm walking down the street, I think it's my friend, it's not. What does that do to my day? 
But I was at least interested in pursuing that question, right? Do Americans want to know what's on the other side of their missiles? Luckily, Apple helped answer the question for me. Um, they loved the app, right? They loved it so much that they rejected it five different times just so more people would hear about it. They said that it contained excessively crude or objectionable content and that it did not appeal to a broad enough audience. Next slide. Boom. Um, this is the rejection notice that I got a few different times. Uh, so I made some tweaks and kept submitting it. And then one day I got lucky. I changed the name to metadata, removed all references to the word drone, and Apple wound up accepting the app. And it was hit 30,000 downloads in the first week. Um, it was in the App Store for about a year, and then one Friday night I got a push notification on my phone that said it had been removed due to excessively crude or objectionable content. Um, as of today, despite the fact that more than 50,000 people have it on their phones, my app is not in the store. It's been rejected more than 12 times at this point. Um, and it's an app that literally just reports the news. But I've continued the project elsewhere, uh, on Twitter as DroneStream, as an API for my final project at NYU, and now with some journalists at a place called The Intercept. Um, I went from being a person curious about the contours of these covert wars to working on a year-long investigation, doing research um, for an investigation called the Drone Papers, where a whistleblower of conscience came forward um, with classified documents that reveal how this entire relational geography clicks together. It was the most complete picture I had ever seen of what's on the other side of the secrecy. And among the revelations that struck me most were how ominous a, an app about drone strikes may have been. Um, I called the app Metadata, right? which for many was a banal name. What, is, what does metadata mean? Um, but I chose it because there really isn't information about most of these drone strikes. The historical archive I was assembling is essentially metadata about English language news reports about drone strikes. Um, most of the time, if you read the stories, you'll get a body count, maybe a number of missiles, perhaps the name of a province. But for the most part, there's no data or narrative to speak of. Thanks to this whistleblower, however, we now know how central phones are to the entire choreography. When someone is being targeted for a drone strike, the missile isn't being fired at that person. It's being fired at their phone through a complex process of spoofing cell towers and tricking a phone into thinking the drone is AT&T or Vodafone. Um, American operators are able to triangulate a person's location, lock onto it, and then fire a missile at whoever is holding that phone. Talk about a ghost in the machine. Um, we also have a picture of what the geolocation watch list looks like. And if you look closely at the next slide, I think that there's a next slide. There we go. Um, if you look closely at the next slide, you'll see that the watch list of people who are being tracked by JSOC or the CIA, um, it's listed as the serial number in their phones. So the person's name is not even really there. Um, but unless you're living in one of the countries where drones actually fly, you might not have a sense of what it feels like to be underneath them. Last year, I had the privilege of working with Laura Poitras, the Academy Award-winning director of Citizen Four, the Edward Snowden documentary, on her solo show at the Whitney Museum in New York. Um, one of the installations, next slide, uh, that she wanted to make was called Bed Down Location. There we go. Um, actually, one more. Bed Down Location, and it played with this idea of being underneath the drone, right? What would it mean to, next slide, lie down in a museum, look up at a projection of the night sky in Pakistan, Yemen, or Somalia, and actually see a drone in flight. There we go. That's a picture from the installation itself. Um, so what would, it, what would it feel like to actually lie underneath one of these things if you weren't in one of these countries where the drones were flying? Um, so I borrowed her camera and went out to Creech Air Force Base, which is 45 minutes outside of Las Vegas. Uh, it's where they both fly the actual drones and where they test some of the drones um, in Nevada. And this is essentially what it looked like. I will never be able to forget the sound. Excellent. There you go. 
So in addition to the landscape of drone warfare, I'm also interested in what Trevor Paglin has called blank spots on the map, right? So mapping military space. His metaphor of blank spots put me down a few different rabbit holes. One of them was simply this. If it is materially impossible to make the surface of the Earth disappear, and we live in an age of satellites, which are really just cameras in space taking landscape photographs over and over again, an age where nearly everywhere is browsable in high definition via Google Earth, where are the places that have been removed from the digital archive? What do they look like? It turns out there aren't many digitally secret places in the US, um, at least not many places with as creative or as obvious a redaction method as in the Netherlands. Um, these images are from an artist named Mishka Henner uh, for his series called Dutch Landscapes, and they were downloaded from Google Earth. It's about four slides if we can go through them. So that's one way. Um, but I was really curious in actually pursuing that question. What do all these spaces look like? So I decided to try to do something similar to the prison project um, for military space. So I essentially constructed a data set from a few different places of every known US military installation around the world and tried to take a snapshot with satellites of each one of these sites. Um, once again, I started with a map then ran a script and began compiling a folder full of images. This is what the website looks like. You can find this at empire.is. It's about trying to see a, a military footprint. There we go. Uh, this is Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. You can go pretty fast through these. This is Guantanamo Bay. This is Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona. This is where all of the decommissioned aircrafts go. It's called the Aircraft Boneyard, essentially a grave, graveyard for airlines. Or not airlines, military aircraft. Um, this is Naval Communication Station Holt in Australia. This is in North Carolina. It's called Harvey Point. It's an old CIA base. Um, if you zoom in, you can see that this is where they built the fake Osama bin Laden compound. This is on Bing. Um, this is Volcal Air Base in the Netherlands. This is how it appear out, here, appears on Google. And then this is how it appears on Bing. A little obvious. This is Manda Bay, Kenya, where a lot of special operations forces take off from. This is Niamey, Niger in West Africa, where the surveillance drones take off from. I'll just raise my hand as high as it'll go. There we go. This is Shabeli Djibouti, where the weaponized drones that fly in Yemen and Somalia take off from. This is the unacknowledged CIA base in Kismayo. And this is the secret unacknowledged CIA drone base in Saudi Arabia that you can see on public satellite imagery. Um, you can zoom in. Also, if you look on Google Maps, uh, somebody has accidentally, I think, geotagged some photos from the area so you can see what it looks like on the ground. Um, and then this last one is particular to today. Uh, so this place is a 20-minute drive from this auditorium. Um, I think some folks might be familiar in the room with it. Uh, I went there yesterday, actually, and it's right after 9-11. The U.S. basically would kidnap people before sending them to Guantanamo, uh, and in the back of, or in the basement of this building, uh, there were I think six prefabricated cells that were placed on springs so that detainees couldn't get a sense of what the floor felt like. Um, so they were con consistently off balance. Um, but yeah, this is literally from here. If you wanted to go, 20 minutes. <laughs> In Bucharest, Romania, in a residential neighborhood, this building is a secret the Romanian government has tried to protect. For years, the CIA used this building as a makeshift prison for its most valuable detainees. It is codenamed Bright Light, and it is here that 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was held, along with others, before heading to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. So say former U.S. intelligence officials identifying pictures of the prison. So what are some of the domestic equivalent, equivalents in the United States, right? How have the tentacles of the war on terror constructed the American landscape at home? 
Uh, right after 9-11, parts of the New York City Police Department started imagining themselves as intelligence agencies, uh, dispatching plain-clothed detectives into communities of color all over Bay Ridge, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, beyond. Um, known as the Demographics Unit, their mission was to map entire communities of people and identify what they called, what, what are called so-called ethnic hotspots, um, primarily targeting Muslims of 29 so-called ancestries of interest, most of which were just the names of countries, uh, one of which was curiously American black Muslim. Um, the demographics unit created detailed files on the places where people ate, prayed, and shopped. Officers would walk into businesses, bodegas, restaurants, bookshops, um, and they would eavesdrop on conversations and ask the store clerks questions. So I started collecting some of the photographs that they took. Um, these are photographs that are in the leaked Associated Press documents. Um, and they're all very banal, right? They're just sort of the front of a building, someone walking past the store. Um, they're, they're very much like photographs you would see on Google Street View. You can keep going pretty quickly through these. So these are all extracted from leaked documents again. Um, and the demographics unit, though it was active for nine years, is said to have never generated a single lead. This website is at profiling.is. Other parts of the American landscape I've spent time tracing include the institution of policing more broadly. In the years since Oscar Grant was shot by Johannes Messerly on a BART platform in East Oakland, videos of peace officers executing unarmed people of color seem to surface almost every week. Harkening back to the moment of Rodney King, I can remember watching the Oscar Grant video, having shopped at the grocery store at which he was a butcher, having lived a few avenues from Fruitvale Station, and thinking that something about the way that video was circulating represented a shift in our media landscape. Until recently, the names and narratives of people killed by American police officers were relatively local knowledges, right? Everyone remembered that one case from their childhood or from their neighborhood, but by and large, there was no centralized repository where this catalog of violence lived. Now journalistic institutions are competing over who can do it best. The proliferation of phones, those with cameras and internet connections, has meant that what was already happening in black and brown communities across the United States, routine police violence, quotidian street harassment, uh, the Michael Slager planting of tasers, could enter the living rooms and social media feeds of folks who didn't live there as well, right? And visual evidence travels. The never-ending loop of Eric Garner's breath being taken away from him on camera, the sound of his voice diminishing, these things shake people to their core, right? They make folks shut down cities. For me, the phone as a site of intimacy, of solidarity, of, potential net, of, of unsettling news, of potential empathy, is as important as the phone as bearer of information. Sure, it gives us what Juno Diaz calls news of the world, but it also gives us our loved ones, ephemerality, pictures of our family, sexts. My phone holds the only image of my grandmother in the days before she passed. Thinking about these themes and about what it would mean to, to let an archive speak, I made an app that would do a similar thing as the drone app, but for police violence. It's called Archives and Absences, uh, and it's meant to visualize the landscape of police brutality in the United States. It's also very simple. It just sends you an alert every time the police end someone's life. When Mike Brown's body began circulating at light speed from that spot on Canfield Drive, to the phones we all keep in our pockets, something more than a media moment was happening. An organizing movement was coalescing. Folks were standing in the streets and demanding an end to something that has been happening for a very long time. And part of me wanted to make something useful, but most of me could do nothing but listen. And then I read something that stopped me in my tracks. In thinking about what I wanted to say to you today, um, I thought a lot about negative space the outlines of a thing unknowable or unsaid. I thought about Morrison's unspeakable things unspoken and her search for the ghost in the machine. I thought about Saidiya Hartman's work, particularly her choice at the beginning of scenes of subjection to not reproduce Frederick Douglass's account of the beating of Aunt Hester. What does the choice to not represent something, 
have to teach us in the age of social media. I think about that unsettling moment that happens all too often when someone's life has just been taken, perhaps in public, perhaps by a police officer, and suddenly here they are, circulating through your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed on autoplay. Hartman chooses not to represent the spectacle in order to call attention to the ease with which such scenes are usually reiterated, the casualness with which they are circulated, and the consequence of this routine display of the ravaged body. Hartman chooses instead to look elsewhere, to consider those scenes in the archive of slavery in which terror can hardly be discerned. By defamiliarizing the familiar, she writes, I hope to illuminate the terror of the mundane and quotidian rather than exploit the shocking spectacle. I find a lot of value in that way of thinking. And so, back to wisdom, the thing Toni Morrison says comes after data, after information, after knowledge. Teju Cole is an artist who traffics in wisdom. From his visual work on Instagram, to his small fates on Twitter, even to his playlists on Spotify, and that is to say nothing of the essays, the literature, the photographs. It seems as if Cole is after a set of questions and their attendant ways of seeing that is never at rest, always in motion, always between time zones, always engaging with the blind spots. He published an essay a little while ago, the one that stopped me in my tracks, called Death in the Browser Tab. There you are, watching another death on video, Cole writes, in the course of ordinary life, at lunch or in bed, at a car, in a car or at the park, you are suddenly plunged into someone else's crisis, someone else's horror. It arrives, absurdly, in the midst of banal things. That is how, one afternoon in April, I watched Walter Scott die. The footage of his death, taken by a passerby, had just been published online on the front page of the New York Times. I watched it, he writes, sitting at my desk in Brooklyn, and was stunned by it. He goes on to recount his second and third viewings of the video, in addition to his own journey to North Charleston, the site of Scott's death. In the near distance, just to the left of the paved track that bisects the grass, was a small memorial at the spot where Scott fell. This was not only the scene of a crime. It, is also made, it also made visible things that were not apparent in the video. The last view Scott saw, the exit from the lot, the unnerving quietness of the area, the banality of dying in a side lot off a side street in an unremarkable town. Reading his essay, it occurred to me that these kinds of journeys were possible for every person in that archive, every person whose life was ended by the police that year, every person in the Pulitzer Prize winning database of dead folk at the Washington Post or at the Guardian. How many places would appear to be like that lot off a side street in an unremarkable town? If you set enough tangents around a circle, Cole writes, you begin to recreate the shape of the circle itself. What is the shape of the American landscape? Which are the tangents worth walking and which are the circles better left untraced? Freddie Gray, Betty Jones, Walter Scott, Sandra Bland, Michael Brown, Yvette Henderson, Natasha McKenna, Jessica Williams, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, the list goes on. Using location data from every one of these fatal encounters in 2015, I started assembling a wall of elsewheres, a grid of meaning, the last view someone else may have seen. Teju named it officer involved, an immersion in the environment of someone's last moments. It was a search for a different kind of ghost in the machine. A few months ago, I updated the project for 2016. Um, police officers killed more than 1,000 people in the US last year. So every frame of this video is from one of those sites of violence. Uh, uh, so now I'm solo that I can see under the skirt of an ant. Eh. Solo that I don't get high no more when I turn around no more, I just go hand. Solo my cup is a rojo, my cholo, my friend. Solo that I can admit. When I hear that another kid is shot by the popo, it ain't an event no more. Solo that I can admit. When I hear that another kid is shot by the popo, it ain't an event no more. No more. No more. No more.
So I want to close with one final geography and a brief note on hauntings. If the American landscape is ghosted, always already by its various normative annihilations, how do they appear in our data? There's an organization called Humane Borders in Arizona, just west of Nogales, that maps the places people have died while trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border. They put out jugs of water, trying to dissuade folks from crossing, and they work with the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner to help identify some of the human remains. My friend, the novelist Daniel Alarcón, went down there to Sasabe, one of the towns just west uh, of Nogales, um, and we collaborated on a, on a project called Fatal Migrations that looks at some of the places that these bodies were found. This is what the map looks like. And then this is where the landscapes are. So when thinking about the geography of the southern border and the movement of bodies and capital that traverse it, I was struck by a very brief work of fiction, Yuri Herrera's Signs Preceding the End of the World. It narrates a crossing by a character, Makina, over a river and through the place where the hills meet, past the obsidian mound in search of her brother. She traverses a physical territory, the U.S.-Mexico border, a place that in our current political moment has been almost entirely reduced to metaphor, right? In some senses, it is not even a geography. It is a soundbite. It is a place without a face. It is a place in need of a wall. Buoyed by the brilliance of Herrera, the patience of Morrison, the attention to detail of Cole, I set out to look at the entire landscape of the U.S.-Mexico border, all 2,000 miles of it, in order to see what might be gleaned by looking at the borderlands in aggregate. Um, this is actually the last piece I'll show, and I probably won't show the whole thing because it's six minutes long, um, but you can see it out projected on the floor there. Uh, it is executive produced by Laura Poitras, and it's called Best of Luck with the Wall. This one, I think. Oh, no. I think it froze. Oh. You can see it on there. on like that for seven minutes. Um, anyway, thank you very much. If you guys have any questions for Josh, please go ahead. Hi, I have hey. a question. I was wondering if the first app that you built, the drone app, yeah. if that really changed your relationship to war. <laughs> you know, I certainly started it not expecting for it to at all, um, and it absolutely did, because for the last five years, I've had to track news about drone strikes in a way that I never would have um, before. In order to send all the updates, I would basically just had to read a bunch of news stories and then manually send out uh, notices. So yeah, it, made, it put me in touch with the news coverage in a very different way, and I, I think it probably changed my professional direction because it made me go work with some journalists who were who were trying to report on those wars. Do you see a uh, upscaling or a downscaling in police brutality? In which one? Sorry? Police brutality. In police brutality? In the U.S. 
I think that I certainly see um, fewer people caring about it right now because there's so many things to worry about. I think that the last election in the U.S. really recalibrated a lot of where folks' attention is. Um, I have friends who are sort of longtime activists and people who, who work, you know, on police brutality, and the overwhelming thing that I hear from them is just, you know, pe people don't care anymore. There's still just as many people being killed by the police, but the news coverage is much more sparse um, because the planet is exploding, as so it seems, right? Um, but no, I think that, you know, I think certainly it helps when people gather in places to, to protest the, you know, the fact of these killings, but they, they very much are consistent. They keep happening, you know? It's terrible. How do you find it to work? How do I what? I work with, uh, with journalists. I work for a place called First Look Media, um, under which is The Intercept, uh, which is a national security website. So we do long form investigative journalism and research, uh, and I do data visualization in the newsroom there as well. Has your work put you in danger until now? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think I'm a, I come, you know, I'm a relatively privileged person. I'm a, a, a white dude with a blue passport. Um, I, I can certainly go places that other people probably would not be as safe going. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty clear not to break any laws ever, but I'm, all, you know, I'm interested in, in sort of finding where the line is in terms of visualizing things and seeing things that are inherently public, right? Like these intelligence agencies are public institutions. They are financed by public money. And I think it's important to be able to look at them squarely and see them for what they are. Thank you guys so much for coming.